So good day, friends. This is Dr. Bob Hamilton, and you have tuned in today to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. So thank you for making uh, this podcast a part of your day. It means a lot to me. I know you folks out there. I know what you're doing. You're busy chasing kids and trying to make a life, uh, trying to live life, pay bills, all the things that human beings have to do. So the fact that you've tuned in today means a lot to me. So thank you. If you like what you hear, pass it on to your friends, your family, everybody, because we want people to hear the people that I bring to you on a weekly basis. And, and today is a very, very a special day for me. We are literally girdling the globe. Uh, I have two authors on. Um, they co-wrote a book, which is entitled Let the Children Play. The subtitle is How More Play Will Save Our Schools and Help Children Thrive. Uh, it's a beautifully written book, uh, folks, and I and I encourage you to, I, we will give that name again a little bit later on. But um, the two gentlemen I have on the line, one I am finding um, in Queensland, uh, Australia. His name is Passy Salberg. Passy is one of the world's uh, most respected authorities on educational improvement. He has served as a school teacher, a teacher educator, the director general at Finland's Ministry of Education, and he was a visiting professor at Harvard University. He's been recognized by the Lego Prize in recognition for his work for children's education, creativity, and the right to play. And he's now a professor of education policy at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Uh, Passy Salberg, welcome to the Hamilton Review. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you, Bob. And in addition to Passy, we have William Dole. William Dole is a a best-selling author. He's a TV producer for networks, including PBS and the History Channel. And he has served as a Fulbright Scholar in residence at the University of Eastern Finland, advisor to the Ministry of Education and Culture in Finland. And he's written for Washington Post, LA Times, New York Daily News, and USA Today. He's a very accomplished individual. He now lives, he's now living in, in Helsinki, Finland, so we're this is the amazing thing. I don't think I've ever done this, gentlemen, to have two people on different sides of the globe that we're talking to. I love technology, and this is where technology is really wonderful, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a miracle. It, it, it is a miracle. It really works well. So yeah. those uh, for yeah. those listeners out there, I, as you all know, I like to have my guests tell a little bit about who they are. And uh, Passy uh, Salberg, I'm going to have you start and just give a, a maybe a, a five minute overview of, of a little bit of you, who you are, where you grew up, uh, your passions. What were the things in life that uh, brought you to where you are today? Yeah, thanks so much. And in Finland, we we often introduce ourselves much more briefly. I don't think that I need five minutes, but I'll tell you a little bit about this. Um, uh, my my situation. I was born and raised in Finland, very northern part of the country in the middle of the woods, actually, uh, that has had a big impact on my life as a who I am, but also my views on uh, childhood and learning and, and uh, you know, all those important things that we try to uh, emphasize uh, in, in our book. Um, my environment where I grew up was also educational. My parents were educators. We lived in a um, in a small village uh, schoolhouse, um, and obviously that determined very very much what I what I kind of uh, desired to be when I grew up. So I went to teaching immediately after school. Uh, I was working working in one of the high schools in southern Finland, um, and it it kind of a built in this idea of. Um, you know how to work with children. Um, I know that you you work with children in a different capacity to look at their well being and health. But for me, the 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 big question of always since the, since I was a child was that how do we um, how do we offer the world to children in in a ways so that they can learn from it, that they can learn from the experience of adults and all those things that we give them. So that's a, a kind of a, that has been the, the driving force in my work uh, until today, uh, basically, that now now I'm looking at a little, little bit different things um, and different perspectives of the same same idea. So I, I spent a long time in Finland in um, system level leadership, working with the, uh, what would 
we call probably a department of education uh, in Finland, we call it the Ministry of Education, and also in the uni uni uh, universities in Finland to look at how educators could be prepared. So um, that was my experience uh, that I took from Finland before I moved to um, work in an international space. So I've been spending almost 10 years of my life in the United States, in Washington, D.C. and Boston area as well. So I had a good and deep understanding of uh, a different type of educational environment and childhood culture as well. Um, so, so my children have been growing up a little bit in the United States. Uh, I have two two boys here with me in Australia right now going to another different culture uh, of childhood and education as well. So, so I've been really privileged throughout my life and my, my career to have um, have had opportunities to try to understand you know how this how childhood and cultures actually collide as as you, you call it in different parts of the world it's it's really important if you want to understand your own uh your own environment your own communities and schools and children i i think it's a richness to to try to do so in a different settings just like what william um explained earlier so i'm currently a a little change has actually happened um, since this introduction was written that you, you read earlier. I am a professor of educational leadership still here in Australia, but now at the University of Melbourne. That is about uh, uh, 2,500 kilometers away from here, where I'm ha just having my long weekend holiday with my family and about 12-hour flight across the Pacific Ocean uh, to California, where you are hosting this <laughs> Uh, Hamilton show but you know that's that's um that's who I am and education has always been my my big passion um uh, I was awarded the Lego of Lake of prize uh, seven years ago for for my life long work in in these topics and issues with children and play and that actually uh, the Lego prize brought me into uh, the um the fact that we we started to write the book together with William. We probably talk about that a little bit later. But this play idea has been with me uh, as a as a professional concept, probably a little bit uh, um, shorter time. Uh, but learning and creativity, childhood, uh, you know, empowering children to be the best they can be, has been always with me through uh, classroom teaching, uh, system leadership, research. Uh, and international advisor uh, as well. So I continue that work here now in Australia. I'm, I'm still very closely connected to Finland and some other countries. I follow the um, the North American developments and literature and uh, issues very closely as well. So um, that's what I'm doing from here. And uh, as I said, I'm very, very pleased and honored to be part of this conversation today. Thank you, Pessy. Well, you know what? Listen, uh, Australia is very fortunate to have you down there. Honestly, so you are, you are uh, obviously a person in great demand. So, congratulations! You're you're an accomplished individual. So, William Dole, your your turn to tell everyone a little bit about your background, a little bit about uh, your uh, your journey. Um, you have the microphone, sir. Thanks, thanks, Doctor Bob. It's great to be with you, and it's great to be on. Uh, with Posse, and I would just um, uh, stress that, in my opinion, uh, Posse Salberg, who's a man who literally changed my life in terms of what I've been working on and where I'm living and what I think about childhood, um, Posse, his body of work, uh, and I would say this to him even if he wasn't on the call, uh, he's probably the most insightful and most important thinker on childhood education in the world today. And if you don't believe that, I'd suggest you go to YouTube and start looking at his TED Talks and his presentations because no one else is doing this to the level of uh, excellence and passion that he is doing. And our book, uh, Let the Children Play, which the cover photo has uh, three children running through the woods, is yes. that sort of the whole message of our book, uh, echoes my own childhood, which was spent in two places. One is in Upper Michigan, in a rural uh, forest, uh, Great Lakes kind of environment, um, in, in a small town. That was every summer um, I spent there in unstructured, free, outdoor 
play. It was the golden age of play in the United States when you could, you know, you could run around the town when you were seven, eight, nine years old. You could, uh, you could uh, make up games with your friends, and you could literally run wild in nature and with friends without adults hovering and structuring your life. Uh, uh, especially when you're on vacation. The other half of my life was spent in Manhattan, where my parents, who were also educators like uh, Posse's parents were, um, they co-founded the first Montessori school in New York City um, in, the, in the 1960s. I was one of their first students. And that, as you know, Bob, that is a very... Um, uh, programmed and intensely thought through platform of play with a lot of freedom and beautiful materials. And, you know, for me, it was a, a pure joy because it connected with what I love to do. And um, it was a way of socializing and getting to know other children and learning all the important things we think we want children to learn, uh, but in a fun way. And, you know, what's wrong with that? That's that's called the efficiency in, in, in my estimation. So um, 10 years ago, I was co-writing the memoir of a civil rights hero, the great civil rights hero, James Meredith, who was Martin Luther King's number one personal hero as a reminder of his stature, you know, in the Pantheon. And um, his passion is education. And I said to him, hey, why don't we reach out to the experts in, in, in America and ask them how to improve our schools? So we did that. And one person, uh, Howard Gardner, the great education professor at uh, Harvard, Harvard. Uh, said something that introduced me to Posse and changed my life. He said, look at Finland, which does the opposite of everything we're doing in the United States right now, and read Finnish Lessons, a book by Posse Salberg. And I thought, that's a bizarre, what are you talking about, Finland? I haven't thought about Finland since I was, you know, a child growing up in a Finnish majority town in Upper Michigan. And um, I tracked Posse down, and his message of basing childhood education largely on free outdoor play, indoor intellectual play and discovery and periods of freedom and choice and failure for children, you know, the, the, the idea of allowing children to fail and to be brave and to make mistakes and not be punished was astonishing to me. It was the opposite of everything I was hearing in New York City in terms of giving children pressure and early academics and testing and standardized testing and, and uh, you know, over direct instruction and so forth. So uh, we got together and I wound up loving Posse's message so much that I came to Finland to study their education system. I had a seven, eight-year-old son at the time. He's now 16, and he's grown up in Manhattan and fin uh, Finland, and he's um, seen the differences between the two. So the, the bottom line of our message really is that play is the most forgotten and most important foundation of childhood and childhood education. And you know, Bob, as a pediatrician, you belong to a group, I'm sure, called the American Academy of Pediatrics. Yes. Uh, incredible yes. organization that guides parents' thinking on, you know, breastfeeding, um, child safety and, and automobiles and so forth. They said something a couple of years ago that really blew my mind. Uh, that They issued a position statement that included the following sentence, referring to the lifelong success of children. Now, what do we all want for our children? Lifelong success sounds pretty beautiful, you know? Absolutely. And they, said, and they said, quote, this is the American Academy of Pediatrics, almost 70,000 children's doctors like Dr. Bob in the United States, quote, the lifelong success of children is based on their ability to be creative and to apply the lessons learned from playing, unquote. In other words, that's what we have to give children, it's what they want. And we can even deliver it to them in school a lot as a way of boosting their um, their lifelong success. What's more important and more beautiful than that? No, I, I listen I, I listen to both of your stories here. And as a kid, I grew up in a relatively small town in Northern California. And you're exactly right, uh, 
uh, Patsy and, and and also uh, William, in terms of the freedom that we we enjoyed as children. I remember as a, ch a young child, <clears throat> a very I mean I I, I mean it sounds like I, I was being uh, ignored by my parents or you know uh, that they didn't care about me. But I I remember wandering through the neighborhoods and we lived near an area we called the woods, and we spent hours and hours, you know, building forts and running here and climbing trees and all those wonderful things. And I, I do, um, you know, as living in, in an urban area now with my, my my own kids and my grandkids, I do rue the fact that, uh, that those opportunities seem to be really rare uh, with kids today. And those kids who are getting out of, outdoors and doing things are oftentimes engaged in very, very structured play. This idea of just free form enjoying yourself uh is, is becoming passe. I, I want to I want to read a a quick paragraph from the actually the introduction or the forward to your book. It was written by a, a very eminent uh, Sir Kenneth Rob Robinson. And this is something I think that a lot of people will may find shocking. It says almost two thirds of parents say their children have fewer opportunities to play out outside than they did themselves as children. Over half of children spend less, often much less than one hour a day on outside play. Play is increasingly an indoor rather than outdoor experience. Almost one in 10 children never, never play outside at all. Uh, the accepted convention for the treatment of high security prisoners, by the way, he says, is that they spend at least one hour a day relaxing and exercising outdoors. These are prisoners we're trying to uh, reform. So I, I find those those numbers uh, really one a ten percent of children never ever go outside, never play outside. This does not bode well for the culture in my in my mind, and um, I do think that that play was certainly foundational for me in terms of learning just, you know, we would play baseball in the streets and football and everything. And we were constantly fighting as kids. I can tell you that, but we were <clears> negotiating, <throat> we were learning how to engage, engage youth with uh, other, other kids. So let's, let's talk about your book. I, I, cause I think your book is so critical and this, this conversation could actually go hours, friends. We're not going to make it hours, but um, I want you to talk about some of the values, the value of play. Uh, Passy, I'll let you uh, hit that first. Yeah. First of all, Bob, uh, you know, this, um, this line that you read from Sir Ken Robinson, who passed away three, three, a little bit more than three years ago, was uh, written just before the COVID uh, pandemic came around. And what we have seen during the uh, uh, the global pandemic, obviously, in many parts of the world, was that the children were kept indoors uh, almost 24 hours a day for long periods of time. And what happened to many of those kids, actually, uh, was that they found the uh, the digital devices at home because there was nothing else to do if you when you hang around in, in indoors all the time, and now we can see uh, when the pandemic is almost gone is that these devices have remained with kids and it's even harder to to find children going outdoors and and doing play. So in many ways the situation now after the pandemic is even more complicated than it was before because of this this new part of the culture in their lives um with the gadgets and and technology that is a one <clears throat> another dear topic that william and myself uh, are currently currently working on but i i think that the talking about the power of play um and and you know very few people actually do it better than the pediatricians and your colleagues Bob and and we we give a full credit to the work of uh, children's medical doctors and well-being experts in our book as the messengers of this power of play and obviously uh, in the times like these the 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 most important aspect that we should look at when we are uh, thinking about what play and especially free unstructured outdoor play can give to children is to enhance their well-being and health and there's uh and, and let me say this again there's nothing more important uh today than than this to find ways to um uh, help help children to improve uh, their, their own well-being and and health as well and this is the the fundamental power uh, of play 
a note about the the lack of decline of playtime and especially free play um, is very beautifully captured by another play expert called Peter Cray, who um, I believe still lives and works in Boston area. Uh, he, he's using with his colleagues um, uh, a concept called children's independent mobility. And, and they, they, they go so far as claiming that because of the declining of the children's independent mobility. That basically means that kids can hang around, take be in charge in their own doings in the forest or outdoors or playground or in, indoors has significantly decreased over the last couple of two or three decades. And so they, they argue that this uh, this is linked to the declining uh, declining well-being and health overall of children. It's a big, it's a big argument to make. But they have a research uh, evidence and and support for this, which is you can uh, we can replace the children children's independent mobility concept with the play free play, and and this is this is what is at stake <clears throat> at at the moment. So there's one way to talk about this question, Bobby, that you asked by listing all the benefits that the play gives. But I think it's equally important for parents and anybody who is listening to this conversation to keep in mind that the when we reduce the time of play uh, or, or prevent or keep our, our kids from playing and, and being in charge, that has another set of negative consequences in their in their lives. Anxieties and and uh, um, other aspects of well-being uh, or ill-being that are very clearly linked to this um, uh, this situation that we in many parts of the world, including here in Australia, that is amazing. The country that has one of the one of the most beautiful and exciting natural environments and, and cultures is we are still keeping our children indoors and away from playing more than uh, more than ever before. So. I, I think you know this conversation can go two ways. One is that we we list all the all the good things that comes with play that we have done in the book, but then the other one is um, that I'm, I'm sure that Bob, your colleagues and other, other uh, health experts are are reminding people that um, what are the the downsides of the fact that we are we are keep, we are not giving our children even this one hour of free play every day that we should do just like uh, Sir Ken, Ken Robinson was saying. Yeah, I, I guess maybe uh, and and maybe William, you can you can speak to maybe the definition. I I, I can read uh, a couple of definitions. One of them was that um, uh, the definition from uh, Professor Stuart Brown. He says that play is anything that spontaneously is done for his own sake. It's a simple definition, but. William, uh, can you give us, because play, we're, we're using this word, and I, I would like to at least formally define it. So, William, can you tell us your definition? Right. Well, uh, Pasi Salberg and I uh, cite a number of different uh, related definitions in, in our book. Um, what it means to us broadly in childhood and in childhood education means delivering to children what they're naturally programmed to yearn for and thrive in and that in and not only in school but out of school and that is periods of intellectual and physical freedom and discovery and experimentation and socialization with other kids and discovery of uh nature and the world on largely on their own certainly in a safe environment where you know uh, life-threatening dangers are generally re removed or reduced in probability. Um, but, you know, there's a there's a beautiful, uh, there's actually a, my favorite, my new favorite uh, passage from the Bible, I think, does a very good job of this. This is from Proverbs, and it's a, um, a female biblical force who is quoted as a witness and a participant in the creation in um, Proverbs 8, uh, 30 to 31. And she says, uh, quote, and she, she's talking about God. I was with him forming all things, and I was delighted every day playing before him at all times, playing in the world. And my delight was to be with the children of men. In other words, perhaps there's, uh, the Bible is saying that the universe was created by God in a playful process 
with wisdom as his deputy or companion or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, when you think about that, you realize we may be doing a lot of things very wrong by taking recess away from children, for example. A, a, a large majority of American public schools, especially poor uh, uh, with with poorer populations, have demolished and and re removed recess from the lives of kindergartners. The city of Chicago had no recess for thirty years until fairly recently. Our book directly inspired the state of Illinois legislature to pass a, a law two years ago, guaranteeing recess to every uh, uh, pre-K through middle school student in that state, of which there are 300,000, the right to a daily unstructured outdoor recess. And we've got to do that in every school, in every town in, in the United States, because this is a critical, we think of it as an emergency, because if you take away physical activity from children, Let's face it, they're lucky if they get one or two periods of gym physical education per week. And if you're taking recess away from them, or if you're uh, surrendering to um, digital devices, hijacking movement at recess, you're then denying children the lifeblood of learning and life for a child, which is movement and physical activity. And this is uh, based on the science, it's based on the evidence. As Posse says, nobody knows this better than uh, the pediatricians of America, and it's time we all woke up, paid attention to the American Academy of Pediatrics, and redesigned the school day, and perhaps the, school, the schools themselves, to deliver what we know children need. And when you do that, the beautiful thing is that there are experiments in Texas, Oklahoma, um, and other parts of the country right now, where much more recess is being delivered through the day to children through the day, uh, as they do here in Finland. Every single hour, every child in this nation uh, gets 15 minute on average of outdoor play, regardless of the weather. And I've seen them go out when it's, you know, mm -hmm. 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and, um, and, and when you do that, Bob, what happens? Uh, the uh, behavior improves, time on task improves, test scores improves, and everything improves. So. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, you know, something's working. I, I listen, uh, the Finnish schools are, they're kind of famous. Uh, and Passy, I, I, there, there's this test called the PISA, P-I-S-A test. And this is an internationally given test, I believe, to, toward the end of high school. Um, and randomly, uh, Finland, which has got a very liberal, I guess you call it liberal. I don't know if you call it what, how you call it, you don't, you know, uh, but their educational approach is to allow this kind of free time to, to happen in their, their academic day. Um, suddenly they're on the top of the list and you kind of go, wait a second, these guys are play they're having fun and they're still, <laughs> they're, they're winning. Uh, I thought you, you, I thought it was the very opposite. You couldn't have, you had to, you know, buckle down is, uh, as my father, a former military guy, would say, you got to buckle down. That was my dad's uh, recommendation, which I probably needed. But anyway, uh, the point being is that they're having fun. They're taking this 15-minute uh, obligatory time off. And I think, the, I think um, William, that the, the lowest temperature is minus 36 Fahrenheit. Is that correct? I think after below that, they won't let them go outside. But uh, I love... <laughs> I love the fact that they they said, okay, kids, you're going outside. I don't care if it's zero degrees. That to me is it builds character of nothing else. But Pasi, can you speak? Um, you obviously you're coming for your your finish. You have a little bit of national pride there, but speak to us about the fact that suddenly Finland has become a leader in um, in education be, just because of the of the tact that you have. Uh, the direction that you have taken in letting kids be, uh, you know, express themselves and have these moments of 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 uh, uh, of exposure to the, the big wide world. Yeah, absolutely. And these international assessments that you mentioned, Bob, they have been around for a good 20, 20 years uh, now. So we have a lot of data and evidence. I, I guess the the most interesting lesson that we've learned is exactly this that you can you can have 
a well-performing or high-performing education system where the most of the children are learning well um, uh, by a very different approach to childhood and, and education. And Finland is, is, is not the only example, but it's a good example of that, that you don't need to have long hours of instruction inside the schoolhouse, no recess. Uh, <clears throat> you don't need to have a lot of standardized assessments or pressure <clears throat> or even homework for children um, if you if you design the not only the school system but also the society more around children and childhood, and I always remind people that you it's impossible to understand Finland's school system uh, by only looking at the teachers or the curriculum or the teaching that goes on in in the schools without really looking at the whole society and communities how they have been designed and built around the. Uh, individual needs uh, and characteristics of our children, uh, including healthcare, of course, um, but many other the, many other issues that are focusing much more on children and who they are and what they need to grow up healthy and happy. That Finland, uh, together with the other Nordic countries, is doing doing really well. But I think that the the uh, as I said that the the big takeaway from this Finnish story is that uh, we can we need to find much smarter and intelligent design for the school systems uh, that looks very different to what we have here in Australia or uh, in most parts of the United States uh, or England or many other countries that really um, understands the the true nature of children and the importance of childhood, including play, uh, and then builds the school teaching and learning and all these activities that goes uh, goes on there for children in a ways that will give uh, uh, these young people and best opportunity to grow up and realize the world around them. And that's what Finland has been doing really uh, since the, the beginning that we ha- we had our school system. I think the, the uh, mistake that many people uh, make is to believe that somehow Finland had a magical uh, school reform that all of a sudden uh, brought these amazing uh, international outcomes and results uh, to to the world and and awareness of people <clears throat> people in the world we have Finnish education system has always been built around the idea of whole child and the importance of developing different aspects of children including the well-being and health systematically throughout the schooling and in the community so it's it's interesting to see that some of these some of these ideas uh, that Finland has had in its culture and uh, school system for many many years are only now be becoming more broadly realized. Like the state of California is a good example of that. The 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 whole child approach that California schools public school system uh, has been emphasizing now for a few years uh, is basically the the old uh, century old Finnish Finnish idea. The the concept of uh, full service schools or community hubs. Uh, again, a good, California is a good example. It's becoming a, a global phenomenon now, uh, uh, probably accelerated by the the, um, uh, the aftermath of the, the pandemic. Something that Finland and Finnish schools and communities have done for forever. So it's a. I, I think what, what I try to say here is that if you really want to understand the Finnish school system and how how children are linked to the schools and teaching and learning that happens there, <clears throat> take a broader approach and lens to look at the Finnish society as a whole and how how the children have really been put in the center place, not in everything uh, necessarily completely successfully, but uh, the policies and ideals and values are really um, giving children the center place and then build the, the services and support, including education and health around uh, these very different uh, little children and little citizens that we have in our communities. Yeah, I mean, I think it's obvious that you have included children into the the bigger the bigger culture, and that is such a powerful thing. And I think that that uh, transgenerational inclusion has made a difference. Um, I, I am impressed, and I did not know this uh, about the fact that the the Illinois school uh, Illinois state has uh, enacted this law. And and if if you guys had any part of that, and it sounds like you did, in in causing that um, them to make that uh, those kind of changes, please uh, accept my my absolute uh, 
uh, adulation. And uh, I'm so I'm impressed by that because that is a, you've you've changed the lives of literally hundreds of thousands of children for the for the good. Um, I'm wondering your message is a, is a very powerful message. And as I read the book, I'm just kind of going, wow, 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 because I'm learning things. But has is this message getting out? Like, for example, I'm thinking about South Korea, South Korea. Um, they have a very, very rigid and also I think Japan to a degree uh, schooling system, which is long. It is difficult. Are these is your message of play, which is such a critical message. Is that getting out into other parts of the world as well? well William, Bob, I'll let you I'll let you answer that. Bob, it's. Um... It's 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 really fascinating because well I I remember my own child's first day in a Finnish public school in rural Finland he was eight years old he I, I I dropped him off in the morning I picked him up in the afternoon and he came out looking devastated he looked he he was emotional he was almost crying and I said hey what what did they do to you in there what what happened and he said I don't want to leave. I said, what do you mean? He said, I don't want to leave. I, 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 well, they made me leave. And he said, uh, and I said, well, you could go back tomorrow, you know? And he said, oh yeah, really? So, <laughs> so the idea of having children so enthused that they want to run to school every day, and jump out of bed and go there. I think we owe that to every child. Now, he had that in Japan. We think of Japan as being very pressurized, pressure cooker, competitive, and it is in the higher grades. But my son attended fifth grade in a standard neighborhood, urban Tokyo, uh, Japanese speaking, Japanese public school. And you know what they gave him every day and every other student in that large uh, public school? 15 minutes of recess every single hour outdoors on a grass field because the, the the educators know that that's like a minimum that you have to give children if you want them to be children and enjoy ch childhood and enjoy uh, school and learn but uh finally bob the the idea of play you, uh, let's let's go to china for a second and we actually went to china and doing the research for our book because we heard about the new gold standard in pre-k through kindergarten education in china which is radically upside down and different from what you think of as uh, you know pressurized memorization and uh, stress-filled Chinese education. Uh, it's called Anji Play. It is a radical uh, concept developed in a province called Anji. It's being rolled out across China. It's one of the most beautiful things happening in China today. And it's all based on half the day is outdoor play including risky outdoor play, some, some risk involved, and construction, building structures out of wood and logs and um, low-tech stuff. And, you know, this is in playgrounds where they fly the hammer and sickle on a red flag in the middle of the playground. It's, and it's startling to see this screams of joy, hundreds and hundreds of children doing their own thing with, you know, adults keeping them safe, but but becoming uh, uh, discovering the joy of being alive and of childhood on their own largely with wonderful materials and a beautiful system that allows them this kind of freedom. So it's not just a Finnish idea. It's it has its roots largely in the way America used to uh, educate its children uh, to 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 some extent. And it's something I think that all children share around the world. And it's not that hard to do. Uh, this is largely a free intervention. Uh, it you know it's not a bells and whistles new education technology platform that requires retraining your teachers and billions of dollars of investment. This is uh, uh, not that hard to implement. And when you do it, it works. So that's our message is that remember play, give it to children, and uh, you'll see wonderful results. One of your uh, lead uh, quotes in chapter eight, which you, the title of that chapter is the Finland style play experiments. You quote uh, an individual by the name of Heike Hoponen, who is the principal um, of a Finnish school. He's, and the quote is, school should be a child's favorite place. I love that. Uh, I mean, for a lot of people, school, you guys, do you like school? And I ask this question frequently of my patients because I, I always ask them uh, how they're doing in school. And I go, do you like school? 
the universally the answer is, especially from the boys, no. <laughs> it's a very there's a very very rapid response. No, I go why not? It's boring, really boring. <laughs> it's boring, and and I think that that's and and your point you make a point in the book uh, that say you bored children don't learn, and so obviously and and Patsy, I'm going to ask have you answer this. You want I mean I you can have fun in learning. And I think you talk about that idea of learning can be fun. Um, how do you, your your message, Passy, to the, the teachers who are listening to this podcast right now? Uh, yes, you want we want our kids to learn how to read. Yes, we want them to do, be able to calculate and do math and everything else, all the things that we need to do to actually, uh, you know, live in in this in this world that we live in. But um, what is your message to to teachers, uh, Passy? Yeah, I think uh, we need to have a much better and slow conversations about this whole topic because, you, you know, I often meet the educators and teachers and authorities who believe that what we are saying in the book is that uh, all learning should be fun all the time or that all learning should be based on play. And of course, that's not what we are saying. We, we are saying basically that the school should be a fun place. The school should be a place where children feel engaged and listen to where they have agency for their own things. But, you know, learning needs to have many, many forms. And I'm 100% as a former mathematics teacher uh, in favor of every single child learning to read and write and do their mathematics that they need in life. But we need to we we need to have the conversations in uh, in our homes and communities and schools in a way that we really understand what we are talk, talking about and what we are against uh, up against with at this time when we have, as you said earlier, that we have more and more young people who are not engaged in 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 their education in school. Um, uh, we have more and more young people who are feeling. Uh, ill and and their their mental health is going down, uh, and it's not necessarily only because of the school, but school has a role to play with this one. So we need to raise these these questions uh, in a different ways. That so, what would a school look like in the future that would be built around uh, more around children's experiences in play, uh, engagement, their their voice and agency in the school, without without compromising these needs for you know learning and achieving things that they need in life but then the other thing is that we have no idea what the future will look like in five years or ten years from now what we do know that children all children all young people need a very different skills and habits of mind to be understand that future and be actively shaping and creating that future and and those things are often very closely linked to um, uh, free play and creativity and, and curiosity, those things that we, we uh, kind of a champion uh, in, in these books. But my my message to the anybody listening to this conversation, uh, especially if you educate, work in a school, and you probably know this already, is to uh, sit down and have a good conversation with parents, with the children, with the community, um, including pediatricians, about uh, what the school could look like um, if it was designed and will be designed again uh, for all these needs that young people need to have and everything that play has to offer uh, as part of the, the school day. No, I, <clears throat> well, I, I can only add to that, um, that we, we have to design new school uh, uh, we have to have new visions of school. And the first thing we should do is we should forget about the um, the politicians and the standardized test vendors and um, the uh, cliches of the past. And we should bring in teachers, we should bring in children, and we should bring in pediatricians. It's because you know what the pediatricians are going to tell us is, Children need a heck of a lot more physical activity. They need uh, every day through the day. 
uh, in school. And it's the school's number one job to provide that to them as a foundation. And we should be uh, taking much better care of their mental and physical health and well-being. As Posse said, that's something they do beautifully here in, in, in Finland. And um, we would have much better schools if we had that discussion now. And as Posse said, in a slow uh, deliberate way, uh, and we're not we're not doing that now. We've got to start doing it right away. No, there's no there's no no question that the sedentary nature of of just being in school and not having these kind of free moments to run out and play is really bad. I mean, we're seeing a epidemic of obesity in America, which is I see virtually every day in my office. But um, and and just if nothing else, uh, gentlemen, having kids outside for 15 minutes and said, go out and get some fresh air and run around, uh, that'll help to, uh, you know, get some, you know, burn some calories and maybe uh, tone up these kids. Um, you guys make a, a very important point, and we haven't really touched on it yet. And this, I think I'd like to, pass I'd like you to, to comment on this. Um, and that is that you said no apps, no uh, standardized tests, and no tablets. Uh, and let me just say one thing. Not too long ago, uh, this idea that we're going to get a, a a tablet in the hands of every kid, particularly, Los, by the way, in Los Angeles, the LA Unified School District bought into this in a big way, uh, try to get a tablet in the hands of every kid. And um, I have always looked at that with kind of suspicion, because I don't think you everybody uh, necessarily uses a tablet in the right way, but the I, I this is a very low tech and and what you said, uh, William, in terms of this is kind of a a low uh, income. Uh, this is not like a big outlay of money. Uh, in fact, if I think about trying to get you know apps and and um, and uh, laptops into everybody's uh, hands is being a big outlay of money. But uh, your thoughts about that, Passy, about uh, why you guys put that in your book. Yeah, I think this is <clears throat> ten, 10 years ago, there were a lot of people in, in Finland and around the world who kind of believe that uh, that we can we can give this technology and devices to children to do what they need to do. And then they, they are able to put those things away. But that, as we know now, that that's not happening. Um, it's I, I think we, we also refer somewhere in our work to what uh, Chris Anderson said in a New York Times interview a few years ago, that if he has to... Uh, if he has to put the the smartphone or any handheld internet-based technology in a continuum between candy and a crack cocaine, he said that it's much closer to crack cocaine than candy, which indicates that even the tech people um, are, are saying themselves who are, are part of the this industry that it, it can be a very toxic and bad idea to uh, just leave kids on their own devices when it comes to apps and technology and, and something else. And that's why I think what William and I, we, we have done in this book and what we are working on currently is to try to find ways to um, give a real purposeful alternative to this uh, technology that is not itself bad, but it's uh, becoming bad if it's uh, uh, something that dominates the the children's use of time, and particularly if it's an excuse from not playing or going outdoors. And uh, uh, again, you know, this is part of the big part of the conversation that we need to have rather than just forcefully, uh, you know, put regulations and bans. I think there's a room for banning devices and, and gadgets when it comes to school education. But otherwise, more important thing is that children and parents really understand how to live safe and respons uh, responsible and healthy life uh, with these devices around and uh, at the same time, remember these rules that the, the children, every child needs a certain amount of uh, outdoor time and play and, and physical activity was uh, like, like William was um, uh, saying. This conversation can be very sensitive in a, in a sense that there are people who can hear us saying or writing that we are against, um, you know, certain certain way of using using technology or those devices i think uh this is more about what is done and how how uh how well children will be able to understand the the perils and or risk and harm 
and benefits that comes with these devices. But Bill, you probably have more to say about that because that's a big part of the work uh, in this play context that we have been working on recently. Yeah, it's it's an incredibly interesting discussion. Right now, mm -hmm. our country after country, including Finland, is giving teachers the power to ban uh, uh, mobile devices in the hands of children during the school day, which I think is a is, is a pretty good idea just to minimize distraction and bullying and the displacement of physical activity at recess and so forth. Uh, Sweden, for example, if you want to look at the real cutting edge of this discussion, look at Sweden, which last month decided it was going to stop digitalizing uh, its schools and go back to paper textbooks and paper-based education. Now, there's no evidence that says that's a bad idea, you know, other than just the collective wisdom of throwing technology at every education problem. Um, and, you know, Posse has recently said to me, adults should not assume that we have the answer. Meaning when we're talking to children, Children know that we're on our devices too often and that we're drifting off into, uh, you know, 10 o'clock at night checking CNN. And um, they know that about us. Yeah. And the point is that we're all in this together and we should be asking children for their opinions on how to manage this. I don't think we're doing that enough yet. And um, uh, we should be looking at uh, all kinds of ways of delivering uh, uh, education to children. And Posse and I are fairly convinced that the answer is not in infinite universal over-digitalization of children's school lives. We think there has to be a much more enlightened discussion to provide a more uh, um, efficient and um, humanistic uh, balance to it all. So, you know, we don't have the answers, but, we, but we're trying to ask these big questions and try to, uh, you know, get a global discussion going through to navigate, because it appears that the current model is not sustainable, meaning unlimited digitalization for children. So the answer is, okay, well, how do we, what do we do with this? And how do we, how do we not, how do we, not only how do we use technology, but how do we not use it? And what are, uh, Bob, what are the real 21st century skills? And how much of them can be delivered by staring at an electronic screen, as opposed to cutting them off for a while during the day and doing face-to-face -face debate and discussion and collaboration and uh, you know, discovery of uh, curated paper textbooks, uh, knowledge in them. So that uh, this is an intriguing discussion that we're hoping to uh, get started uh, even more with our next book. Although we do cover it to a large extent in, in in let the children play our current book because digital play is a you know mega topic among parents, pediatricians, and children. And um, we just, you know, we don't have the answers yet, um, but I th we, we really think the key is to talk to children uh, and teachers and pediatricians. No, I, I think that you, um, there was a, a, a quote in your book uh, and page, uh, actually, I think it was written by uh, Sir Kenneth Robin, Robertson, who said he, he said, so many kids are, and I'll quote him, alone in a room with a screen. And I read that, I wrote it down. And I said, that to me sounds really kind of bleak, number one. And I, I do think there is a certain point where if we're, if we're trying to educate kids and trying to make it, make it you know, intervene, um, thinking about that 15 minutes where you, you let kids off and to get some free play, certainly with older kids and teenagers who have, who have phones, my my vision would be that I would see all these kids walking out of the classroom and flipping on their cell phones and looking at their, you know, go on Facebook or something. Uh, that is a little bit self-defeating in my mind. And I and I see this. I, I mean, I look, I'm I'm not blind. I go out to dinners and I watch kids and we all do this. And we and I see groups of kids. Uh, nobody's talking to each other. There's a handful of kids and they're all looking at their screens. And you see that all around the world. I, I travel and, I, and you guys see that where you're at too. Um, but I think in the confines of the school education, I think it's reasonable to say, hey, listen, guys, we're not gonna, you're gonna, this is a, 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 a cell phone free space. And uh, it's just, you know, and, I, and they can learn how to have fun and talk. And, I, and, and 
William, you're you're so you're so true that you need that face to face interaction to really know how to communicate, and that's what that's one thing that play does. Uh, you know, we you had those negotiations, you had those uh, moments where you weren't looking at a face, we were looking at the screen when we were kids running around. We were we were engaged completely, and that's something I think that uh, that's a big challenge. I, I'm looking forward to your next book. Well, listen, I, I promise you that I would get you guys, uh, William, you're, I think you're, it's late at night over there in Finland. So you probably have to go to bed. And mm -hmm. uh, for you, uh, Patsy, there in Australia, you probably want to get breakfast. So uh, I want to cut our conversation. Gonna, we're going to have to end this conversation, although I, I, we could talk for hours. Honestly, this is fascinating to me. And you guys have done, you, you guys are the experts. I so appreciate you. But uh, Patsy Solberg and William Doyle, thank you guys for coming uh, today on the Hamilton Review. Thank you. Bob. Thank you, Bob. It's really been a really certainly a pleasure for me to, to just uh, have a, this conversation. And friends, the, the name of the book is called Let the Children Play. It is published by Oxford Press. It is undoubtedly, you'll find it if you look for it. And um, this is a, a really, really readable book. It'll challenge your thoughts about uh, what we're doing with our kids and what we should be, you know, the direction we should be taking to really enhance and really put our kids in the best possible uh, place for their future. So gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to write this book. Thank you so much. Thank you're, you. You're welcome. And uh, friends until next time, uh, thank you all for tuning into the Hamilton review. We've been having a great conversation with Patsy Salberg and William Doyle. Uh, please pass this on to your friends. This is a very important conversation. And until next time, be well. You have been listening to The Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your day. Tune in again next week on Apple Podcasts. Rate and comment and tell a friend.